The Big Bangs of IR. This video discusses an article with the following title. The Big Bangs of International Relations. The myths that your teachers still tell you about 1648 and 1919. The three authors are Benjamin de Carvalho, Halvard Lyra and John M. Hobson. Benjamin de Carvalho is a senior research fellow at Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. His research interests are, broadly speaking, between three fields. He works on issues of broader historical change, such as the formation of the nation-state in Europe, sovereignty, and the role played by confessionalization and religion. Next, Halvard Lyra's main areas of research is foreign policy and diplomacy, with a special emphasis on the Norwegian varieties. He also has a long-standing research interest in historical international relations and international thought. Last, Professor Hobson's main research interest concerns the area of inter-civilizational relations and everyday political economy. His work is principally involved in carrying forward the critique of Eurocentrism in world history and so historical sociology, international relations and international political economy. Now I will proceed with the article. Within the international academic discipline of international relations, the years 1648 and 1919 have traditionally appeared as central moments within the development of the understanding of international politics. 1648 marked the Treaty of the Peace of Westphalia. 1919 marked the end of the First World War. These years in international relations theory have been presented as pillar moments where modern political phenomenon developed. These phenomenon are anarchic states system as well as state sovereignty. In the years following this, Attempts to dispute the importance of these specific moments have been encountered. This analysis used international relations textbooks as research material. Efforts have been made to make use of textbooks which have been most widely read by students. Little discussion exists on whether these two moments are important or not. That's because of a presentist nature of the discipline where history is analyzed according to the nature of the present moment. The revisionists argue that the story of 1648 recounts an origin myth, a genesis if you like, about state sovereignty. The story of 1919 recounts an origin myth about the discipline of international relations. The myth of 1919 is bad for us in four ways. First, it makes the discipline a historical. Second, it ignores racist foundations of the discipline. Third, it assumes that international relations underwent a miraculous virgin birth without precedent. The big two problems here are a Eurocentric narrative and the effect of power on theoretical thinking. I will discuss the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. It was signed by almost all European states to end the Thirty Years' War. This was a war in which religion played a big role. The revisionists argue that modern states and modern sovereignty both did not originate here. Conversely, Hans Morgenthau writes that The Treaty of Westphalia brought the religious wars to an end and made the territorial state the cornerstone of the modern state's system. This shows that this idea is entrenched in theory. I now debunk the myth of 1648. Historically, the treaty turned out to be an effort against an idea of a system of states which was already being developed before this year. The 1555 Peace of Augsburg gave states in the Holy Roman Empire the right to choose their own Christian denomination. This right was in fact retracted in 1648. This year is often claimed to be a defeat of the Habsburg Empire's goal to conquer Europe. This is untrue. When the war broke out 
the empire was already weakened and other European states wanted to take advantage of that. Therefore, the 1648 Westphalia Peace Treaty is part of a complicated historical development which was continuously in flux rather than a clear-cut political revolution. Nevertheless, international relations textbooks still tell a different story. Heather Ray writes the following. There is much debate over exactly when the process of early modern state formation started, with some scholars looking as far back as the 8th or 10th century. Others cite the early 15th century, with the convening of the Council of Constance of 1414 to 1418, treaties agreed upon at the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, or the 18th century as the most significant in the development of the state. Most other textbooks seemed, seem to be at odds with themselves. On the one hand, they want to be nuanced about the treaty, but on the other hand, they want to maintain a mythical origin story about the field of international relations. Even some of the most famous textbooks repeat the myth. Spiegel and his co-authors write the following. This treaty established the important principle of sovereignty that remains the foundation of contemporary international politics. In an obvious blow to the church, this meant that kings could decide domestic policy, such as the official religion within their domains, free from outside interference. The principle of sovereignty recognized in the Peace of Westphalia represents an essential element in the creation of the modern nation-state. Now I will proceed and I will talk about the myth of 1919, which is the end of the First World War. The myth consists of three parts. First, that international relations was born in that year. Second, that the discipline arose from the horrors of the war and then tried to end all war. Third, that before this year, there was an attempt at idealism, but it lost out to realism. A big figure in this story is E. H. Carr. He was presented as embracing positivism and science rather than idealism and utopian thinking. Kuhn, with his idea of scientific paradigms, also had an influence on a mythical story of how Carr championed a positivist position who fought idealistic theorists. In reality, this story is untrue. When we read Carr again, we will find out that he occupied no such position. In fact, we here once again apply a bias where we want to make sense of historical writings from the perspective of debates that happen in the present moment. Writers only applied the labels of liberalism and utopianism to interwar thinkers far after the interwar period itself. One example of this false dichotomy is that many of the so-called liberal authors of the interwar period actually supported British and American imperialism and colonialism. What made this myth possible was what we called the politics of amnesia rather than real settled debate. More importantly though, the discipline of international relations emerged far earlier than 1919. Books about the topic were already written well before that moment. Moreover, the well-known international journals of foreign affairs was in fact called the Journal of Race Development in 1910. We may then claim that the discipline's ways of thinking was founded on a racist worldview. There are two further reasons why 1919 is not an important year. First, the interwar scholars drew on pre-war texts. Second, most of their writings were underpinned by racist and imperialist stories. This means that the 1919 is a noble myth, but it is not noble at all. In fact, it is a dark side of our theory. 
The inconvenient truth is that most of the international relations theory has served the purpose to promote Western political power. The stories have been a West Side story. The discipline also emerged in the context of increasing colonial resistance against the West. In this context, theorists tried to justify and preserve enduring imperial power. In the discipline, US President Woodrow Wilson is thought to be a founding father. However, he said that self-determination should not be granted to underdeveloped non-white people and that inferior races should be brought to maturity by the West. Even though he is known for the idea of self-determination, it is not well known that he tried to keep it from non-whites. In 1919, he said that The un unqualified hope that men have entertained everywhere of immediate emancipation from the things that have hampered them and oppressed them. You cannot, in human experience, rush into the light of self-determination. You have to go through the twilight, into the broadening day before the noon comes and the full sun is on the landscape. Even anti-imperialist theories were inspired by racism. Some of the anti-imperialists advocated the end of colonialism to prevent immigration from the colonies, which would flood the white gene pool with inferior non-white races. All this is historiography, which is the study of the development of methods in historical works. Our textbooks ignore this. The textbooks call this historical period liberal. We are still told that international relations was born out of the tragedy of war, and that realism developed out of the failure of interwar idealism. For this reason, we still cling to an idea of a first great debate in international relations theory. I will now proceed to the concluding remarks. I confirm that the myths still persist in textbooks today. Why do they persist? Here are a number of reasons. First, the historical literature on 1648 is barely read. Second, with the increasing number of academic specializations, Scholars feel like they only have time for the standard textbooks rather than alternatives. Third, international relations is inherently biased towards presentism, which is a tendency to explain history in terms of present issues and conflicts. After all, the discipline tries to actively solve modern problems. Last, historical insights are ignored because they differ too much from, from the political realities of the present. The central paradox here is that we must conclude that the basis and foundation of international relations is in fact racist and imperialist. If we want to break from this tradition, we must also break with the idea that 1648 and 1919 were important moments. In this way, there are border controls on theory. The theory that was developed just in Europe and the US, and it did not take account of ideas originating from elsewhere in the world. While the myths are wrong, they have still served as a basis for the development of modern 21st century thinking.